Welcome to a show about learning technologies so powerful they transcend the boundaries of reality itself. I'm your host, Pinky Gonzalez, and this is New School VR. Welcome back to the show, everybody. This is Pinky Gonzalez, and joining me today is Felipe Summer. He's the president and co-founder of Nearpod, one of the world's leading educational technology companies. Felipe, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you very much. Glad to be here. I'm excited to have you here. Where are you calling from today? I'm in uh, Miami, Florida, actually in Aventura, a little bit north of Miami. Very nice. Is the company based out there? Yes, uh, we have our main office here uh, in Miami, uh, and we have a growing office of currently 60 employees. Excellent. And are your are all of your offices in the United States? Uh, yes. Yes. We have a, a smaller office in, in San Francisco as well. Um, but yes, all, everything's in the United States. The company has been mentioned in numerous uh, New School VR podcast episodes prior to this. And that was the reason that I reached out. It was obvious that you guys have made an impression in the academic world and beyond. Um, so what is it? What is Nearpod? So uh, Nearpod is a technology platform that allows teachers to create and share uh, interactive digital content with students uh, across mobile devices. Um, we created a technology that allows a teacher to push content and get feedback to all devices at the same time. And Nearpod works on all platforms, iOS, Android, Windows, web. Um, and um, a couple of years ago, we started developing a content store with lessons. Uh, there are supplemental um, and core curriculum type lessons uh, for teachers to use in addition to them being able to create lessons. So there are some ready to teach lessons as well as they have the ability to create their own lessons um, in Nearpod. So take us back. How did the company get started? Around five years ago, um, I... I was involved in a, an interactive marketing business. We had developed a very rudimentary synchronization type technology with, with early iOS devices. And uh, we saw a, a disruption coming in education. We saw infrastructure being set up at schools, uh, mobile devices growing. So not only cards, but bring your own device and one-to-one -one models and digital books, like a lot of content going from physical to digital books. And, and we thought that this sort of presentation technology could be awesome for the classroom to enable the next generation of, of teaching. Um, and then we basically completely redo the technology um, and we created this content tool for teachers to create their own content and basically upload their, their previous files and then add interactions. Um, so basically, we saw an opportunity in education. We 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 talked to teachers and we started testing this at classrooms in in the K to twelve space in the U.S. And we saw that there was a need um, a, a need for teachers to have a way to manage these mobile devices in a way other than just giving apps to kids, right? Uh, to be able not only to be in control but just just to be able to facilitate a class and moving from an old lecture style to a new, more interactive, collaborative session. And I think that Nearpod um, was very well received by, by teachers in general. When you mentioned the bring your own device concept, this is one thing that, as you know uh, better than I, um, this idea that students bring their own device into these classrooms, how does that work in terms of um, compatibility or you know which app stores they're using or parental consent? How... how, how how does that work in the Nearpod ecosystem? Well, I mean, I, I think that part of our early success, if we can call it that, uh, was due to the fact that we <clears throat> we produced a a system that works on any device. So in, in the case of Nearpod, it's very, very straightforward. As a teacher, I use any device, whether I'm using my iPhone, an Android device, a tablet, a computer, PC or Mac, I log into Nearpod and I launch a lesson uh, that when I launch a lesson, it, 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 it creates a, P, a code, a five letter code. So A, B, C, D, E. And um, 
students go to near put on their devices and they just type A, B, C, D, E, it doesn't matter whether it's an iOS app, an Android app, a Windows app, or a web app, and they just join the lesson. So now when teachers on their device move to the next screen, all devices, it doesn't matter which one it is, moves to the next screen. So if the, if the device, if the student device is internet enabled, which is trivial these days, uh, Nearpod is gonna work. Um, so that was really a, a differentiating point for us as many, many of some competing platforms for the classroom, they work for either iOS or Android or web, but it's hard to make it compatible to any device. Outstanding. So as always, I'm going to uh, include some reference videos and links on the newschoolvr.com website so people can see some of this stuff in action, which I think is is helpful um, in part because you guys just have a beautiful user interface and it, it makes a lot of sense just to see it. <laughs> um, but for those that are just listening, um, what walk us through some of those basic features. And we're, we're going to get to the VR side of things here in just a minute. But um, in terms of where where the platform is coming from, what what's the aside from the teacher being able to control exactly what the student sees, what sorts of interactive capabilities do the students have access to? So when teachers can expose students to a number of uh, what we call interactive features, one is, for example, a poll, right? The teacher can poll the classroom on a topic and provide alternative answers for students to, to select. When the teacher receives all the answers, can share back the results with the classroom. Uh, so that's one feature. There's a quiz feature, which is similar in the sense that students answer, but these are right or wrong questions. So and, and students can answer up to 15 qu a quiz of 15 questions. So basically, uh, this is very well used for an exit ticket. So you teach, the teacher teaches for 45 minutes, the last 10 minutes, they give a quiz to the students and everybody does the quiz. And then real time, the teacher knows how students are responding. So you have a pretty good understanding of how effective was the, the teaching in that in that session because you know the results right away. Um, there is uh, web website access, so I can put push students to a website, and now students can navigate at their own pace um, and go through through different um, I mean website pages. Um, so that will be another interaction. Video, I can push a video to students, and then students can play the video at their own pace, uh, replay it, uh, stop it, um, just for their own understanding. Uh, we have um, some games like um, memory game where they need to match objects. We have a fill in the blanks type game. We have um, virtual field trips, which is one that we're gonna talk about significantly in this, uh, in, in this meeting. Um, where basically you are exposed to a 360 degree image and and you get immersed into a reality. Uh, and then that is followed with, with for example, an open-ended question, which is another interactive feature we have. Um, and recently we launched 3D objects. So I can, the teacher can push a 3D object. I will have a library of them uh, to students and students can basically zoom in, zoom out and, and just go into the details of that object. So that's probably 90% of our interactive features. Once a student has uh, gone through one of these experiences in the classroom, are they able to bring that home with them if they are using their own device? Yes, the Nearport has two modes. One is the live mode, which is led by the teacher and it happens real time. Uh, and the second mode is what we call student-based. So the same lesson, you can do it again at home if you if you experience that in the classroom but now you don't need a teacher to move you to different screens, but you go at your own pace. What's good about that, which is used to flip the classroom or for homework, is that if there is a quiz in that session and the student completes the quiz at home, then the, the teacher will receive the data um, and be able to just make sure that the students did the homework or reviewed the case before the classroom. Uh, or whatever the objective is, but that that functionality exists and it's pretty powerful. Yeah, it sure sounds like it. And as a as a parent, and I know we have a lot of uh, listeners who are parents, I love the idea of being able to see the actual lesson uh, right there. You know, this is what they saw. This is what they're taught. These are the questions that they're asked. So if I'm if I'm a proactive 
parental unit, um, being able to to further reinforce that information, I think, is just an an awesome uh, addition to the modern classroom. So let's let's talk about the the virtual side of things. You you guys have been around um, for several years now since t- 2012, but you're just getting into VR uh, with with these virtual experiences and 3D objects. Uh, how does that work, and what does the student need in order to experience a, a virtual uh, lesson? We, we launched something called the virtual field trip, and and that allows uh, a student to get immersed into a 360 degree image uh, and video coming shortly. Um, and as a result of that, uh, what we discover is that uh, there's there's a change in the level of engagement of students. They really get engaged because now, instead of talking, if they're talking um, conceptually about Shakespeare, we take you to the Cronenberg Castle in Denmark, and now you're there, and you feel that you are part of the story. And now we ask you about the setting, and you can you you, you do writing and reading comprehension, but the level of engagement changes because we actually take you somewhere. That has proven very, very effective. Um, and it's actually fairly straightforward. Uh, students actually don't need anything. They need the, their device. And if they use a Google Cardboard type, um, type device, which is fairly inexpensive, uh, they can see that in a stereoscopic way and just feel more immersed. Um, we, as a result of some of our programs, produce these VR headsets um, and we are distributing these to schools as part of their school editions. Uh, we also did a grant where we gave away a number of, of, of devices uh, for students to use with their, with their phones. Um, in addition to these devices and, and, and this feature that we created on Nearpod, we produce content uh, so lessons, over 100 lessons that we have in our store that are ready to teach materials. Um, and they go throughout uh, all the core subjects, and, and I can talk more about those lessons, but these ready-to-teach lessons plus the ability for teachers to create their own VR content plus the headsets that, that we facilitate to schools really produce a nice ecosystem for for this engaging feature to uh, come to reality. Amazing. So if a teacher wanted to to purchase or acquire headsets, Google uh, Cardboard or otherwise, they would be able to get that directly from you? Actually, we don't sell them. We get, give them away as part of um, either this grant campaign or when we, when you buy a school or district edition. Uh, so, but we don't, we don't want to be in the business of selling hardware. So actually, we, we give them away. In uh, show eight with Jamie Donnelly, she's a, a very well-known um, VR enthusiast, ed tech uh, expert, public speaker, and, and a real authority on what's happening in terms of um, technology in the classroom. And we had a great conversation about the, the challenges with the bring your own device and VR experiences, the, the non-standardization um, of, of these sorts of things, uh, bandwidth constraints in the classroom. Um, how how have you guys dealt with uh, different classroom configurations, for example? Not everybody has the same bandwidth or the same technological capability. What are you seeing out there? Is it is it changing or evolving? And how do you guys play a role in that? So so in terms of bandwidth, the the way Nearport works is that um, it consumes really low bandwidth because it downloads the lesson to your device, and now. It, it, it's, it's just you need a an order of one click to move to the, one screen to the other. So we don't see bandwidth constraints for for VR. Uh, when it comes to different devices, um, most phones fit in what in the Google in the cardboard in the devices that we the, the VR headsets we call them that we provide. Um, of course, if um, if you have like a small tablet or a large tablet, you would basically need to move it with your hands instead of just putting that on a, on a VR headset. Um, but certainly, I mean, I, I agree with with Jamie in the sense that there, there are challenges that we need to overcome. Uh, this is not uh, a, a market in equilibrium, if I may. This is all nascent, right? And 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 it doesn't work. Um, in every situation, but let me tell you that this 
this approach, which is very, very pragmatic compared to, I mean, the more sophisticated hardware and the more sophisticated VR content that needs a lot of inexpensive development, this is take, this is, this is making an impact right away. Um, it, we pride ourselves of being fairly pragmatic. And I can tell you that now we have over 6 million students that have experienced VR through Nearpod. This is happening already, and we see this in schools today, um, while in, in many of the other more sophisticated technologies, the level of investment and the setup is, is, is much more complicated. Again, I'm not just making a value judgment on those technologies, I'm just saying that our approach is really work, is working in, in reality today. Man, it makes me smile to hear that there's that many students that have already had a chance to experience this. Um, at, as of this recording anyway, we're just in the spring of 2017, and it's still very, very early days for this stuff. And so there's a lot of unknowns. There's, a lot of our listeners are um, interested in this stuff but may not have actually used it themselves or, or certainly have used it in a classroom and are trying to figure out what's out there. And I think that you guys have had so much experience already is such a benefit to the academic world at large. Um, when it comes to that content, do you do everything in-house or do you source things like the 3D images or videos or those sorts of things from others? Or what's what's your ecosystem like on the content side? So um, we do we, we create the lessons, the, the specific VR lessons in the store are all published by Nearpod. Some of the VR elements that 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 uh, are part of those lessons, like let's say the 100, 360 degree images, we partner with a company called 360 Degree Cities uh, that provides uh, thousands of images for us. Um, we're now uh, we partner with some external developers for the 3D elements, um, and that's gonna continue to grow. and And we are deciding how we're gonna approach uh, the growth of of that type of content. Um, and in some cases, like, um, some of these lessons are appealing to English language learners. We have some authors producing those lessons. So authors is, is a program like a crowdsource program where we partner with teachers, um, that like to create content. We provide some sort of methodology and quality assurance, and then we publish the, we jointly publish the, their presentations in the Nearpod store. So it, it's an ecosystem that is in, in it, it also is it's being created as we speak. We have some vendors, we have some partners, we do some things ourselves, um, but the future is ahead of us. Wow, that's something else. You, you did mention that teachers can upload their own images and, and videos in some cases. Um, are you familiar with the company Sketchfab by chance? Yes, yes. Would something so for those that may not know, Sketchfab is a little bit like a YouTube for 3D images. Um, a lot of that stuff is just readily available to be embedded or reused elsewhere, and others are commercially available. Would a teacher that uh, was interested in using a Sketchfab uh, model be able to bring that into a Nearpod uh, lesson plan? Um, I'm not sure. We, I mean, it, it, it might work through a web share feature that we have. Uh, but it's it, it it it's not it wouldn't work like a native three D image uh, the way we're building it. However, I know that we're talking to several players to be able to expand that. But I mean, I, in the airport, what has been working fair, fairly well is that uh, teachers try things, and because there are new companies coming up with new things all the time, so trying and uh, and maybe hacking the just making it work uh, by adding it as a web share is something that could work. But I'm, but I'm not 100% sure. Sure, yeah, I don't, totally get it. Um, so let's talk about the content itself. What, what really has resonated in terms of the kinds of content or the kinds of teaching materials that uh, really seem to have the most impact so far in, in what, what people are using Nearpod for? So um, this is something that, 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 that really impressed me because when we started, we, we call it virtual field trip because the whole idea at the beginning was that we were going to take kids somewhere else just for the sake of visiting other places, right? Like a field trip. Mm -hmm. But then we realized that there was so much power in using those situations for engagement, but then create content on the core four subjects, uh, that that is what, what's resonating now. So basically 
we build lessons for science, social study, math, and ELA that have a beer component that generates the engagement. So for example, science teachers can explore ecosystems by visiting the Great Barrier Reef, right? So the, the lesson is about ecosystems, but you engage students by taking them to the Great Barrier Reef. Or uh, the, the, the Shakespeare example I provided before, where you're, you're taking to the setting of the play uh, virtually, but then it's about the, the, the ELA aspects of the classroom. Um, or math. I mean, there's one lesson which is my favorite, which is the geometry of the buildings, right? So you take students to different buildings, not for them to just um, see them and that's it, but then to identify the geometry um, figures on that um, on those buildings, right? It's it's powerful because they are really engaged, and then it's about the core subject. So that is, I think, that the the, manifest, the, the best manifestation that I saw in terms of how that content is, is brought to bear in, in the airport using VR. Excellent. Is there a, do you guys have some greatest hits? What would have been the most popular uh, lesson so far? So the, the Great Barrier Reef is one that has been very popular. Um, I personally like uh, a lot one on social studies, which is about the Cold War. Where you're you're taking to Berlin checkpoint Charlie, where the the boundary between Eastern and Western Germany back in the in the in the fifties, and um, there's an activity about escaping from East Germany to West Germany, and so there's a drawing activity. But first, you're there exploring uh, in the virtual reality setting. Uh, so that's a social social studies lesson. Um, there are a number of of very interesting lessons uh, in the store. Uh, some of them are free, and some of them are uh, $2 to $99. Gotcha. Is that per 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 lesson, per student? Less, How does the pricing work? Per lesson. This is fairly accessible, fairly affordable. Um, basically, a teacher pays two ninety nine for a lesson, and they can use it uh, unlimited times with as many class, classes as they want. Nice. So That's pretty, great. Pretty affordable. Yeah, it, does the teacher, is it, uh, is it a requirement to have a, a school or a district license before that lesson can be purchased, or what's no. the, the business model itself? No, no. They, any any nearby user can can use any of the free or paid virtual reality lessons. Gotcha. And in order to use them, do they need a, a license to the Nearpod um, apps no. themselves? No, well, they need to create an account, which is a free account. Nearpod is a freemium platform. Okay. So a lot of this works in the free edition. Great. Wow. <laughs> That's what we, we call a low barrier to entry. <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot of interest for I mean, I'm sure many of our listeners already know about you guys. But for those that don't, um, I'm so excited that there are there are things that are ready to go right this second that you can check out without having to lobby your district IT staff to to get started with. <laughs> Man, that's really good. Uh, where do you see this going? Where's the company in, say, two years from now with all that's going on in, in the hardware and it's sort of VR space in general? Well, we see um, a couple of things. One is we are going to launch um, 360 videos uh, very soon. Um, so the, 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 the video feature and, and adding more content in in the VR images and in 3D objects is something that, that we're working on. Um, and we want to move into the more like VR curricular style. So now you have, you have lessons, right? That you can use here or there. We want to start creating more of a lesson plan that, that is based on VR that a teacher can use for a unit or for a series of units. Um, I think that's, I mean, that's what's coming. I don't see, um, I mean, we, we will continue with this approach, which is low barrier to entry in terms of um, being able to work on any device and with these uh, VR headsets. Um, th that's what that's what's in the short. I mean, in in the next year or two, um, I personally want to explore augmented reality and and understand how um, we could create content that can be augmented uh, by cell phones or by mobile devices, uh, as you point to them. Uh, but we're we're just in it's just in my head so far. <laughs> <laughs> Got, it. Got it. So uh, 
another subsection of our, our list. I guess today is uh, sort of brought to you by the listeners of the <laughs> New School VR podcast. Uh, the, some of them uh, have either been in the ed tech world before or would like to be. They're looking at opportunities to bring technology and solutions to uh, to the academic world. But it's really hard to sell stuff, <laughs> either to individual teachers or or school districts at, at large. You mentioned doing some pilot programs early on. What what? How did you... How did you get to this point? How, how did you find that adoption in such a challenging market? So I think that um, in our case, what happened was um, we we had a robust product. Well, it was not robust, but it looked nice. Um, and we, in, I mean, at the beginning, we saw market fit. We saw that there was a need. I, I used to go to schools years ago to show this technology and every teacher was like, wow, this is amazing. I would use this. So we saw the product feed immediately in the market. And then I think that we made the right decision of creating a freemium model because that provided us um, access to a lot of teachers. Like the, we generate a lot of traction, even with low marketing dollars, for because teachers talk to teachers. That's what they do. They, they recommend things. And if this, if this, if something is good, they will tell their fellow teachers. So we started having a lot, started having a lot of traction, um, and then uh, what we saw happening was uh, we started getting inbounds from administrators, principals, instructional technology directors, um, saying, "I have two or three teachers that love your product. How much is it to have a school edition where we can share content and I can have admin and back office functions?" Um, and that's, that's, that's the way it happens. I mean, it was grassroots. It was bottoms up. We never went and never go and never went and sent to any districts, uh, from the top down, just like a district adoption. We studied by the teachers and we went up. Um, that was our, our experience. I don't know if I answered your question, but I, yeah, yeah, you did. Although you you did just touch on something uh, that I know is also of, of great interest, and that is that is that back office integration um, is is that another level of of uh, premium service, or if a school wants to actually tie it into student records, how do they go about doing that? So, so Nearport the, the school and district editions, which are paid products, uh, provide um, the administrators the ability to see all the teacher activity together. Because if you are not in one of those editions, basically you are a, a, an individual teacher, which you have one level of upgrade from free to gold, and you just pay 10 bucks a month, and then you have a number of additional features, but you are an individual teacher. If you have a school or district edition now, the administrator has the ability to add and remove users of seeing the usage across the board and having statistics um, so a dashboard of usage in the school or district. They have the ability to have a private library, which is a very, very interesting feature, which allows the district or the school to share content and actually build their own portfolio of digital lessons um, that uh, they can share um, among themselves. Uh, they can also... Um, have the ability to share content individually. Um, so that's something that um, that's part of the school and district editions. Nice. If, if a teacher wanted to charge for a lesson plan, is that a possibility? No, not at this point. Our All of our store um, is not open. We, we try to curate the content. Um, we have this author's program. So if, if you're a teacher that wants to create content, you can apply to be an author, and then we would jointly publish that, uh, and suddenly there's a revenue sharing program. Man, that's big. I, I think you're you're very very wise to open up the the content creation and and teaching portion of this to those educators that are really stoked about it. <laughs> it's, you know, the, an infinite number of ways to teach any given subject. So I think having those options is really incredible. Um, how about um, uh, foreign languages or, or non, non-English-based non curriculum? Is it all English right now or what, what are the options there? So today what we have in the store is all in English. Uh, two comments to that. One is we're starting this year to produce content in Spanish. Um, we're, we're piloting this as we speak, but 
let's keep in mind that when when teachers like Nearpod is used in over a hundred countries now. So when you create when a teacher in Denmark creates their own content, the send button in the screen it's in English, but everything else, the questions, the answers, the copy, the images, all of the content can be in Danish, right? Or in French or whatever language. So even though um there's not content that we put in the store in other languages. Well, we're going to try to pilot, well, we are piloting some Spanish lessons and, and I think that we will have um, more like foreign language offerings, probably not for the next school year, but the following. Got it. Speaking of languages, just in general, it, uh, is it is Nearpod used to teach language at all? We're now making a big move into English language learners. So ELLs are a big segment here in the U.S. There are over 5 million uh, L's, so English learners, as, as they're called. And um, there's there's not enough content or there's not good content, I, I was told, by, by, by the market. That's what I'm listening. Mm -hmm. So we are in the pro – well, we've released uh, a, a soft beta uh, of Nearport for ELL, which basically – is content that allows teachers to engage English learners with scaffolding, with activation of prior knowledge, with media, with, um, I mean, Nearport is a platform that the way it's built is, is very friendly for English language learners. Um, so that that's a big push for us uh, these days. Have you found that the, the behavior of the teachers in terms of referring Nearpod from from you know, if they enjoy using it, referring their fellow teachers, is that has that been the same growth process internationally, or is that in any way unique to the way the U.S. school system works? How, what are the differences in in various com countries? Uh, I think that I, that has been across the board. the The difference is that I have an inside sales team here that talks to schools and districts in the U.S. proactively about their needs and how to just better use Nearport. We are pretty reactive in the world, right? So we have in the UK, we have a lot of traction, but it's just because they talk to each other. We don't go after them. Uh, the same in Dubai, the same in Australia, Brazil, like there's something going on in these countries and, and at the right time, we're gonna start working more proactively. Um, but I think because this is a free tool that is so easy to use and so easy, actually it's so easy to implement. Like if a teacher is listening to this next week, um, they, they can just that same day, create a free account, get a free lesson and launch it. And the students just put a code and you're going, that's it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's fairly straightforward. That, that helps a lot in terms of the initial traction. I can imagine it would. I can also see this working in a non classroom setting a lot of these tools i've heard uh you know fantasized about from various you know business business friends and startups this idea of using an, an interactive presentation tool as part of say a public speaking engagement or a lecture or, or you know other business meetings where you want to get immediate feedback from the people that are participating are you seeing it used in in non-academic environments pinky you touch on a hard point uh, on a key point here um <laughs> This is, the, I, I've seen, I find, I, I made a lot of fantasies about this for a long time, and the use case is amazing. I mean, I've used it. I know companies who use it. Like United Airlines is one of our corporate clients, and they use this to train um, flight attendants and customer service people. So this is a training, corporate training platform that could work really well. Um we don't have the bandwidth and we need focus because there's so much to do in K-12 that we don't push that. But I know, and because we we have an enterprise edition, uh, this is used by several companies for their trainings and interactive presentations um, all around the world. Uh, but we are, we, that's not of, of our of our focus. I mean, we don't have the bandwidth. If If, if you give me more resources today, I know where to put them to develop more. <laughs> yes, and that's that's the reality. And and they're also it's a different it's a different animal, right? I mean, same thing as as if I might touch on higher ed. This is used in higher ed uh, across the board. Lots of higher education companies use it, but we don't target them. It's it's a result of of how the platform is built. But at some point, we're going to go after higher ed. 
Um, but but we, I think that we've learned to be focused on on what we need to deliver, which so far is is K to twelve. You know what I think is so important about that is really mastering uh, your core area of competence. Um, but just as we've seen with the 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 blending, the cross pollination between gaming and education, it it really makes sense that one can inform the other, and. I love that that Nearpod has this core academic foundation to it, but when it comes to corporate training, taking the the best practices from that is is powerful. It's going to save a lot of time, and and theoretically, it's going to give you a better outcome more quickly than trying to start from a corporate learning side and then sort of backfill on the fundamentals of learning. Um, conversely, I think the way we we learn as adults or in the real world is generally different than, you know, coming into a, the same classroom every day for semesters on end. And so what what can we learn about the way you might teach an airline employee and and, and relate that to a third or fourth or seventh grade student who's uh, who's learning their, their their core academics? If I may, I, I want to make a comment on what you've just said, Pinky, which is um, there's a lot of traction on professional development. Near what is used in many instances for professional development, which is basically teaching to adults, right? This is teaching mm-hmm. teachers. Um, there are several districts, large districts in Florida, that they have their their PD sessions like in late summer before classes start uh, that basically teach or provide information to teachers a number of topics. And they use Nearpod. I mean, for it's not just to talk about, this is not training, this is PD on flipping the classroom, blended model. Uh, bothers designing learning spaces, emotional learning, like a lot of topics, mm-hmm. they use Nearpod to deliver that instruction. Um, that is something that we're also um, focusing this year with a new product called Ready to Run PD, which is something we're developing with Stanford University. And these are lessons that are ready to teach, that are very rich in content and in activities. Uh, that any facilitator at a school can deliver them to their teachers um, around the sort of very important PD topics. So, wow. so that's another core area that we are developing uh, this year. This is exciting, man. You, you guys really do cover the whole spectrum of what this show is is all about. Which <laughs> Thank is, you. you know, <laughs> um, obviously, we're 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 pretty pretty stoked about uh, VR and AR technologies, but those things follow. The fundamentals of learning, which technology just facilitates. Um, so, hearing that that you're you're active in all of those different areas, higher ed, uh, K twelve, professional training, and and beyond, um, what a great tool and, and a resource that if, if people don't already know about, really should. <laughs> and now they can. Uh, so, to that end, if somebody's interested in this, where where do they find you now? So, go to uh, www.nearpod.com. Um, or download the Nearpod app from any of the stores and create a free account, download a lesson for free, and start teaching. Bam. Just like that. <laughs> Just like that. Felipe Summer, thank you so much for, for joining us on the show today. I, I, I'm certain that, uh, that our audience is going to be interested and, and excited to check this stuff out. So thank you for telling us all about it. Thank you very much, Piggy. Pleasure being here. New School VR is graciously supported by and recorded live at Concordia University in beautiful Portland, Oregon. For over 100 years, Concordia has been preparing teachers and learning professionals for life and for a living. For more information, visit cu-portland.edu. And by Dot Dot Dash, an experiential design and technology studio specializing in custom virtual reality and experiential marketing activations that incite wonder and inspire action. See more at dot dot dash dot io. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or through your favorite podcast delivery app. Visit us online at newschoolvr.com. And thanks for listening. I'm your host, Pinky Gonzalez, and this is New School VR. This VR po- podcast is dope.